Um, I'd just like to start by um, acknowledging Daniel Allen at the Safra Center at Harvard, who put together a team a couple of months ago in March um, to look at strategies um, for pandemic resilience. And the, the basic thrust of uh, the roadmap that we released in April was that there's a false dichotomy between uh, lives and livelihoods that was being um, used to frame the policy choices at that time, that in fact the economic conditions were so dire, and I'll give you some data on this, that, uh, that we really needed to reopen quite quickly, but also to do so in a manner that allowed us to stay open uh, in a sustainable way. And so the case was made in this roadmap for very large scale testing, tracing, and, and uh, supported isolation, which I think has become conventional wisdom now, but at that time was not. And, and part of what Daniel did is, uh, um, in this initiative is to have a series of white papers. And I'll be talking about one of those. Um, so it's not a research talk in the traditional sense. Most of what I'll say will be descriptive. I'll present mostly public data and a few con uh, computations, and uh, uh, then talk really about the interpretation of this data. And I'll just acknowledge the other folks who work on this, uh, worked on this uh, white paper, Divya Siddharth, Nia Johnson, Brennan Terry, uh, Mary Bassett, uh, Meredith Rosenthal, and uh, Julie Siegel. So I'll start by talking about the age distribution of fatalities, uh, which everybody I think here uh, will be very familiar with. But, but the reason I want to start there is firstly because those patterns are going to persist because they are stable now over uh, many different countries. So we have some idea of uh, where they're going to settle. Um, and secondly, because a lot of the data on race and ethnicity and disparities related to those are not age adjusted. And if we don't, uh, you know, so that really uh, means that they have to be treated with a lot of caution. Uh, we have to take into account the age distribution of different demographic groups before we can draw conclusions from that. So that's one of the key points. And then we'll talk a little bit about people who are exposed more than uh, uh, disproportionately exposed, essential workers, those in vulnerable facilities, and talk about socioeconomic status a bit. Uh, and I'll end with this uh, discussion of uh, this treatment and impact if we uh, have time. So this is the age distribution. I'll just go quickly because this is very familiar to everybody that um, vulnerability or, or fatality rates rise a lot. Case fatality rates uh, rise a lot as you, as you, uh, you look at older uh, subgroups of the population. There's variation across countries. So this is just four countries, South Korea, um, uh, Spain, China, and Italy, but uh, within, you, know, you have cross-country differences, but within each country, you get exactly the same pattern, you know, increasing uh, fatality rates as you get uh, older groups. And this is for, from the CDC for the US, they have upper and lower estimates of the case fatality rates, and again, you see exactly the same pattern, the older, the most vulnerable. Um, now, New York City uh, has, has a lot of very good data that it's released uh, uh, in, on GitHub and on its webpage. The Department of Health, and again, you see these are just fatality rates by age, and again, you see the exact same pattern. And I'll just go quickly to the website where this is from. And if you look at the deaths, this is what I have on the slide, but if you look at cases, you don't see that. So the case distribution is much more even. Hospitalizations become skewed towards the older population, fatalities even more uh, skewed towards the older population. So uh, the reason we started with age is because we are going to just keep this in the background when we look at any other data, especially non-age adjusted data. And a lot of what the states are releasing and what the media is discussing is not age, age adjusted. Um, so for example, uh, this may be an obvious point, but if, you know, if all groups have the same fatality rates within age groups, then death rates would be, would be considerably higher among whites who are much older population than Latinos. Latinos are the youngest population in the United States. And so if you, saw, you, know, if you had parity within uh, uh, age groups, You'd, you'd see disparity in, in the aggregate with whites dying at much higher rates. And if you find the opposite, or if you find parity, it suggests actually disparity in the age adjusted rates. And you can see this, uh, so just the demographics of the United States, this is from census. Um, you can see, this is just from uh, the census, but uh, collected by the Pew Foundation, uh, uh, and they separate population into non-Hispanic white and everybody else. And you can see here that the age distribution is much skewed towards older for white uh, relative to the rest of the population. Uh, this is again from the census. Uh, uh, and you can see that in the youngest cohorts, the under 25, Latinos are heavily overrepresented than African-Americans, than Asians, and then whites. And whereas in the older ones, above 65, whites are uh, overrepresented uh, in, you know, in, in all the three lowest categories uh, relative to other groups. Uh, now, age adjustment matters a lot, and this you can see from the New York City uh, data. So if you just look at unadjusted data at the top, you'll get, uh, you, you, you see these differences across groups. 
um, uh, that you see on the top panel of this graph, after age adjustment, you get a very different picture. Uh, whites and Asians come much closer together and, and uh, African-Americans and Latinos, at least in New York City, end up being roughly comparable levels of uh, uh, age adjusted deaths per 100,000 population. Uh, there's another way to look at the same thing. You get much uh, higher fatality rates and comparable fatality rates in New York City between, on the one hand, African-Americans and uh, Latinos versus Asians and whites. Okay, so now we can look at the unage adjusted data and just keep in mind that, uh, that in the background there, you have these uh, disparities in demographic structure. So um, one way to think about you know, disparities by state is to look at the share of deaths relative to the share of the population. So for example, Wisconsin, I'll show you in a second, is a, is a huge outlier along with Kansas. Um, you know, the, the share of the population in Wisconsin, African-American share is about 6%, 6.5%. The share of fatalities among total fatalities of African-Americans is between 25 and 30%. So that's a big ratio of about 4.5 to 1. Um, uh, and in other states, you get a very different ratio. Um, uh, so I'll show you the data for African-Americans and then for Latinos and just keep in mind that these are not age uh, just. So this is the, the disparity measure. So the share of fatalities relative to the share of population. And you see that it's really in the Midwest. You know, the, the biggest disparities are in the Midwest, the six largest states, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Missouri, Wisconsin, and Kansas, are right at the bottom over there. Um, Michigan, Missouri, about three to one ratio, four and a half to one in Wisconsin and Kansas. Uh, uh, Illinois, Indiana behind. And if you look on the vertical axis, the key threshold is at one. So one indicates parity. That means that your share of fatalities is equal to your share of uh, uh, your uh, share of the population. And there are you know a couple of states at the top uh, that lie below one, but most states you you do have a disparity. And this is unage adjusted. And if you were to adjust by age, uh, this would look <clears throat> the disparities would look more extreme because African Americans are relatively a young population. With Latinos, you see something very different. So if you look at, again, at the vertical axis at the threshold of one, you only find four states, uh, Wisconsin, Illinois, New York, and Nebraska, that have uh, fatality rates greater than the uh, population presence, uh, whereas others are below. And this, this, to me at least, just shows the importance of age adjustments, which not everybody is doing, and, and, and the media is not uh, really taking into account uh, properly. So what's driving this? So this is just a descriptive uh, uh, presentation so far with regard to what we see in terms of race, ethnic disparities in the population. So, so to think about a bit about the causes, uh, the underlying causes, you may remember this graph. This is from March, um, uh, you know, when we had the first week of unemployment claims at 3.3 million. And just to give you some sense of perspective, this series has been uh, tracked since uh, uh, the mid-1960s, and the highest ever that it reached, this is people initially filing for unemployment, uh, you know, during a particular week. The highest it ever reached was 1982. It reached uh, 700,000, and then you can see the global financial crisis, 2008, 2009, the highest it reached was about 600,000. And then suddenly it went up to 3.3 million. This is a shock that the economy has not seen since the 1930s. In fact, you know, in some ways it's more severe than the 1930s. That was the first week in March. And then the next 10 weeks, and you know, so, uh, 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 as you mentioned, uh, this is the 10th week of the symposium. So we had you know, this 10th week also of this, um, you know, the, the economic shock from the pandemic. And you've had 40, over 40 million initial claims for unemployment. It went up to 7 million at peak, then slowly came down, but we're still above 2 million. And bear in mind that, you know, in, in, in the historical uh, series, it has never been above 700,000. So the economy is just completely in shambles right now. Um, if you look here, this is Congressional Budget Office forecast, the GDP. Um, and I'd like you to focus on the third row. It's highlighted right here. Um, if you look at GDP, the first quarter, well, the economy shrank, but not, not, not a huge amount. The GDP per capita was 21.6 trillion. And we are projected to lose uh, about two and a half trillion dollars of GDP or about 12% of our economy is just gonna vanish in thin air in the second quarter, which we are in right now. This is a projection, but it's not too far from what we're experiencing. And then you look below that at the unemployment rate, it's never been uh, until, since the 1930s this high. Right now we're you know, aging towards 15%. The forecast for the third quarter is 16%, and, and it could well end up uh, being higher than that. This is totally unsustainable. We can't do that. It's, you know, we've lost 12% of our economy. If it happens again in a second wave in, uh, in the fall, um, 
it will be irreversible. The damage will be irreversible. And it's just, so it's absolutely essential that we manage to find some way to open up, but in a way that's safe and sustainable. Um, there's a, I just briefly mentioned an op-ed that I wrote with Glenn Hubbard uh, uh, in the Hill a couple of weeks ago that tries to make this point that, that, that we need to have very, very large scale testing, tracing, and, and isolation. Okay, so just quickly going back now to the disparities. Um, so although the economy is shut down, I mean, uh, you know, some of us are working from home, but a lot of people are unemployed, as you saw, and, and are forced in some sense to social distance, and others are able to do so. But about 40% of the workforce is not. They are deemed essential. That's the health and care uh, sector, emergency workers, sanitation, transportation, food supply. And these workers are generally lower wage on average, although not uniformly. They have limited sick leave options. They are hourly workers. They don't have hazard pay. They cannot quit, actually. They cannot quit uh, uh, and maintain eligibility in most states for unemployment benefits. So in a sense, they are forced to work. Um, uh, the alternatives, they, they would be better off if they were fired, uh, actually, in terms of uh, unemployment uh, eligibility. Um, and this uh, sector is proportionately Black and Latino. 38% uh, 30, of uh, Black workers are in the essential se sector, 27% white. And part of the essential sector, and this actually is part of this, you know, might have something to do with what's going on, uh, we can talk about in the Q&A if you like, but, but the NYPD has not in 100 years uh, experienced this kind of fatality levels. Uh, there were 23 people killed in NYPD in 9-11. Uh, there are 43 so far already uh, from the coronavirus. And if you compare to what happens in a normal year, about 50 officers a year are killed nationally, uh, feloniously in the line of duty. So we're going to, uh, you know, that's already been swamped and we've got months to go in this. Um, another source of, of uh, uh, um, fatality is coming from vulnerable facilities, in particular congregate settings. And this is sort of relevant when we think about campus reopening. So long-term care facilities, prisons, and meat, meat packing plants, plants in particular. Outside of the New York City metro area, most of the counties with high prevalence have, have got some facility of this kind. About 20,000 cases tied to about 200 uh, odd meat packing facilities in 33 states. Many of these uh, have got poor working conditions, crowded floor plans, lack of sick days, and incentive structures that induce employees, sick employees to report for work. So you, know, you lose your bonus if you, if you take days off. That's all changed now, but there was a lot of short-sightedness in these incentive structures in the beginning. Um, and that led to a lot of spread in the, in the food processing. Right. Two-minute warning, Rajiv. Two-minute yeah. warning. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll, I'll try to wrap up. Um, okay. Um, I, this is just the county data. I'll, I'll skip through that. Prisons and jails, there's, there's a long literature on racial and ethnic disparities in incarceration in the United States. But this is not driving... Uh, the disparities that we saw in the data earlier. And the reason it's not is because although you've got 35,000 cases in prisons and jails, there are uh, 450 odd fatalities. That's less than 0.5% of total US deaths. So although cases are spreading a lot in prisons, the fatalities really are not uh, concentrated there. They're concentrated in the long-term care facilities. Um, and that's shocking. You've seen the data, I think, uh, you know, 43% of total deaths by, by state reports ranging from 21% in New York to 81% in Minnesota and Rhode Island. And you've got more than 50% of deaths associated in one way or another with these facilities in 26 of 40 reporting states. Okay, very briefly, I'll just show you, uh, I'll show you a couple of charts and I'll stop. So with regard to income, so what this does is it tries to see, you know, whether or not you have a relationship between income disparities and fatality disparities. So on the horizontal axis here is black median income relative to the overall median income. So towards the right are states where there's relative income inequality uh, 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 among groups in a particular state. And on the vertical, you have the share of fatalities relative to population. So you can see that there's a sort of negative relationship, not very strong, uh, but, uh, uh, but you do find, uh, so for example, Wisconsin, say, compared to Minnesota, you've got huge differences in fatality rates, but not much difference in, in, in inequality by income. Um, with Latinos, there's no relationship at all with regard to income and the fatality rate. So I'll just, uh, this is my last slide, I'll just say that, you know, the legal literature distinguishes between disparate impact and disparate uh, treatment. And there's some evidence of disparate treatment. That would be if you show up with symptoms and you happen to be black or Latino, you're treated differently than somebody else who shows up with the, the same symptoms and you're white. There's some evidence of that, but, but much of what's going on is actually just disparate impact. So things like the composition of the workforce, vulnerable facilities, underlying conditions, which I haven't had time to go into. And, and so the question is then, you know, is this, does this raise 
moral concerns? Is it a case? Is there a case for targeted action? And here I'll just reference uh, Justin Warren Burgess. Uh, decision in Riggs versus Duke Power Company, that was an employment discrimination lawsuit, which said that, you know, uh, uh, the law outlaws practices that are fair in form, but discriminatory in operation. And it appears that at least our, our existing institutional structures are discriminatory in operation, and I'll stop there. So thank you very much for this very uh, provocative presentation. One of the things uh, that's uh, noticeable in uh, New York Times, they keep track of the uh, incidents of uh, positivity and also death rates. And throughout the city, they're quite dramatically down now from a few weeks ago. And that uh, uh, suggests that even in the underserved and uh, um, areas where there's more essential workers in the city, there's also been a dramatic decrease in the rate of infection and in mortality. Yeah. Uh, is that uh, speaking to the uh, availability of PPE and social distancing in those neighborhoods, or do you think there's uh, another uh, biological reason that could explain that, or uh, access to care has been improved? Yeah, that's really uh, that's really great question. Uh, actually, one of the, the the paper that I'm working on right now for the Zephyr Center is about uh, campus uh, reopenings, and here it's going to depend on very much on the surrounding environment. And as you said, in New York, there's been a dramatic. Uh, uh, decline and also the best forecasting model. So Yugen Gu's model uh, 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 that's trying to forecast into the fall shows New York in dramatically better shape than Chicago, Los Angeles, um, uh, the Middlesex County in, in Massachusetts and so on, and uh, where lots of campuses are located. And so New York has had this huge, huge decline. Partly, so I, I talked to the forecaster about this, you know, what's driving it, and partly it's because the prevalence got so high. So, you know, the, the, the number of, you know, people who had exposed is so high. And that's containing this. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a physiological basis uh, for that. It's, you know, we, are, we have reached the point where we are. Um, in addition, New York City yesterday announced universal testing. You know, they've got antibody testing for anybody who wants it. So these are all factors, I think, that, that have played a role. But partly because we just had such a high, uh, I don't have time to show you the chart, but we had such a high uh, incidence in April that we are really, really well past the peak. Uh, Maria, Paola, um you unmute yourself, you can ask question. Yes, so first I wanted to thank Rajid, Rajiv for this uh, uh, very good presentation. And I appreciated the fact that the, the data that you are using are not data that you only produce, but is just how we look at the data, the data of the city in a way who connects the dot. And I think is important. So I want to ask if your presentation is available if I need it uh, for our students, uh, just to build on it and eventually to collaborate. Uh, it should be available on the website. We post all the uh, talks on YouTube. Yeah, okay. and the white paper, is, white paper is on the Stafra uh, website. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Margaret, if you unmute yourself. Hello. Um, Rajiv, thank you so much for your talk. Um, a couple of comments. Um, and, uh, and, and a question. And that is, you mentioned that um, this is obviously worse, economically worse than the Great Depression, and yeah. then that the damage will be irreversible um, if there's a second wave of this in the third quarter. And it seems to me, at least from everything I'm hearing, that additional waves are kind of baked in uh, to the pandemic. So what are the ramifications then for the economy the other side of this is, is that your data, which is fantastic, but it's actually dependent on states and localities being willing to report the data. Um, so, you. you know, in the cases of prisons, is there any possibility of under-reporting of cases of COVID? Um, where are the prisons located uh, with regionally within the country? Um, and then, you know, basically how willing are medical examiners across the country to evenly report deaths as COVID-19 versus mm -hmm. something else? Oh. Short answer, we have a minute. <laughs> those, are, those are great questions. Um, uh, regarding the second wave, no, we can't, we can't do that. We have to avoid it. We have to get the testing, tracing, and isolation in place so that we, we don't get that. Um, uh, we just, it's just I, I don't even want to talk about the possibilities if we don't. Secondly, uh, regarding the data reporting, you're absolutely right. There's only a you know, you know, few states that are reporting comprehensive data by breakdowns. And there are differences across states. You know, if you look at excess deaths, for example, relative to COVID uh, diagnosed deaths, uh, you do get a lot of differences in some states. So your points are well taken. I mean, uh, we are just working with the limited data that we have. 